Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 193rd video cast, 183rd podcast for the week ending June 29th, 2023. We're going to get through the media here real quick and then get right down to it. We're going to want to keep this under an hour, as I know a lot of people are celebrating 4th of July and are going to be heading out to do fun things this weekend. Uh, first, want to thank my friend Bill and Blake and Mike for setting up uh, to play Maidstone Club this week, which was absolutely amazing. It's right on the ocean uh, in East Hampton. For those of you who are not golfers, uh, that's one of the ocean court, ocean holes there. And uh, it was just absolutely amazing time. Great company. Uh, they also have a beach club. Uh, we were able to have lunch when we were done, so that was incredible. Uh, girls had an incredible swim meet over the weekend, so uh, so that's all the family updates. Let's move on to the media. On Friday, I was on Yahoo Finance with Shauna Smith. Want to thank Sarah Smith, the producer, for having me on, as well as Shauna. And this is where I laid out the second half of the year playbook. What worked in the first half is going to be slightly different than what works in the second half, and we go into detail here. So we're going to go listen to that right now to kick things off. Well, stocks pulling back this week, heading for the worst week that we have seen in quite some time. Lots of worry just about what the Fed is going to do next, how high rates are going to climb in order for the Fed to get a better handle on inflation. So let's talk about what all this means for the markets, what it signals for the markets going forward. We have our all-star panel here for you guys to help break this all down. We have John Galliardi, Fidelity Investments Vice President, Christina Hooper, Invesco Chief Global Market Strategist, and Thomas Hayes, Great Hill a Capital Chairman. Great to have all three of you here. John, let me start with you just in terms of what we heard from Powell this week, once again messaging the fact that maybe two more rates are going to be needed. The market, though, ignoring that. What do you make just of the fact that that keeps happening time and time again and what it signals. So the Fed is a player in the market and it's they're a, the biggest player. So they cannot be ignored. And it's normal, right? All of this is normal because the Fed is always in the markets. They've been around for 100 years. So all of this we got to take with this is just the way it is. But the fact that markets are kind of chugging forward here, and I've been saying this for a couple of years, Above 4,200, it really starts to get hard for the bears to make an argument that we're going down as we're going up. Three higher highs, three higher, how many more higher highs and higher lows does it take for the bears to say, eh, maybe the bulls have got it. But is another rate hike, though, going to change that? Well, I'm going to argue that there isn't going to be another rate hike. That what we're seeing, that dot plot is a paper tiger. Jay Powell is a paper tiger right now. He wants to keep a lid on financial conditions from easing. And so the way he's doing that is by releasing that dot plot and going on and continuing to say, we're going to hike rates more. But the reality is that the Fed doesn't want to hike rates more, that we're in a similar situation to where we were in May 2006, where Janet Yellen was telling them, don't hike anymore. We did it right in 94, 95. Don't keep going. Um, but there is that interest in keeping that lid on financial conditions, um, not letting markets get ahead of themselves. That's what Jay Powell's doing. And in fact, he's achieved his goal this week because we have seen that pullback in markets. Thomas, are you nodding your head there? I agree with Christina 100%. Uh, they have to pin long-term inflation expectations to manage behavior. So they don't want people to expect prices to go up. They want it, people to expect inflation to come down. But I don't think they're going to raise because you have owner's equivalent rent now kicking in off a very high base effect. So that lags um, the, the deceleration in the increase in home prices by about 18 months. And we're going to get a big drop in July well before the live meeting. So I think the skip turns into another skip, turns into a pause. And if you look at five-year inflation break-evens, they've been very successful with this uh, targeting uh, in, the, in the sense that five-year break-evens are at 2.18%, back to uh, levels we haven't seen since 2018. So, so they're being very successful with the hawkish talk and the dovish actions. So it almost sounds like you guys are saying that the market's reaction, even to uh, Powell's messaging this week, the fact that he is saying he's more hawkish rhetoric, yet looking past that seems to be what you guys think is the right response. 
Absolutely. Well, that's going to help prevent another rate hike, right? That would really be the catalyst. I think of a few different triggers that could, could be the catalyst for another rate hike. One, of course, is the market getting ahead of itself. The other is if we did see a Michigan inflation expectations print that's higher than expected. Recall that that was one of the two triggers for the Fed to go from 50 basis points as it had telegraphed to 75 basis points in June of 2022. Um, but beyond that, I, I, I think that um, we're moving in the right direction. And and that finally markets are listening to Powell, even though I don't believe him. What do you think it's going to tell us just in terms of the leadership here? Because so much of the conversation about the gains since the start of the year has been obviously concentrated by just over a handful of names within the tech sector. We have seen that market breadth broaden out just a bit. Not enough, I don't think, to get too excited about. But obviously, it's a step in the right direction, right? You know, for me, I hate to sound like a broken record. By the way, Christine and Tom are awesome. I'm the only person here. I have no idea what Jay Powell and the Fed's going to do. And I, I don't think I, any of us do. We all just like talking I, about it. We all like guessing. You know, it makes for good conversation. What are you talking about? I brought in my crystal ball. Come on. Every time they, they do something, it's always shocking. And the market's reaction is always kind of surprising as well. Uh, but this is, feels like more normal. Uh, the fact that uh, we see the top 10 names in the S&P outperforming the S&P, it's LeBron James. It's Michael Jordan. They score the most points in the game. What would be really unusual if a person comes from the bench and outscores LeBron James. That would be weird. But in this case, we really have the leaders leading. And I know earlier this morning we had somebody talking about home builders as an analyst, and home builders are leading. They're at all-time high. So there are some of your secondary and tertiary players who are starting to lead. So as you said, it is broadening out, and sector rotation is the lifeblood of a bull market. Tom, do you think we'll continue to see some of that rotation into names out of technology? I think that's the, I think that's the trade for the second half of this year. So you, you've seen, you know, up until about a month ago, the bottom 93% of the S&P 500 in aggregate had performed about 0% year to date. Uh, moving forward, we see a scenario for the second half of the year. Maybe you have mid to high single digits more for the indices. I don't think the money is going to be made in the indices. I think the money is going to be made. The magic is going to happen underneath the surface. Uh, and those 90% are really going to benefit. And I think with the Fed getting out of the way, the dollar resuming that downtrend that it started in October could be monstrous for multinationals, uh, specifically the ones that get more than 50% of their revenues from abroad. Uh, emerging markets trade could start to get bids. Some of the higher risk groups like biotech could start to get some inflows. So there's a lot to do under the surface uh, moving into year end. Christina, do you agree with that just in terms of the leadership that we could see? I do think so. I mean, what we're seeing right now is pretty normal for this component of the market cycle, right? We're anticipating, markets are anticipating an economic downturn, and we tend to see a narrowing in, in leadership. Um, but then once the pause um, really does feel like a pause to markets, that's when they're likely to start discounting that economic recovery, and that's when I think we'll see that rotation to smaller caps, to cyclicals, um, and that would signal a, a very different kind of market environment because of, of that expectation. So that is usually when we see much broader leadership and more participating. John, how much of the excitement in the markets this year, and I'm, particularly what I'm talking about, is this hype around AI? There's been so much talk of the FOMO trade, people seeing how much uh, so, so many of these stocks, some of these stocks, I should say, have risen, and they want to jump on board. Is the FOMO trade, is that still a thing? Or as we start to see broader participation, maybe that's going to be a conversation of the past? It's the new story. So there's always three things that drives a stock forward, and Peter Lynch talked about this all the time. There's the story, there's the numbers, and then there's the chart. So when I look at this, I always think of, well, what's the current story? And the market needs, the story is like the lifeblood, right? Because if we stand around and look at balance sheets and charts all day, it's kind of a snooze fest because it's yesterday's newspaper. What's the future hold? And when you say AI, it is exciting, and you are going to need chips, and you are going to need tech. And we're seeing that same leadership that we saw coming out of COVID taking over again. It's so surprising. This year has been so confusing for investors. Remember the beginning of the year, we were all talking about industrials and healthcare. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were a stone's throw from all-time highs, and they took a back seat all of a sudden. Tech came roaring back with semis yet again, and it felt just like, here we go. It feels like 2021 regurgitated. And to be fair, like you said, it's the beginning of a new bull market cycle. It's usually financials, consumer discretion, and tech. 
What about all the talk, though, outside of the U.S.? The more and more people that we've been having on recently talking about just the outperformance of the U.S. up until this point this year. Maybe it's t time to start adding some exposure to internationals. Is that an opportunity, Tom, that you think makes sense, given the fact that I know you guys are very encouraged and very positive, maybe that the Fed isn't going to raise rates again, but what if they do? Yeah, I, I think it's not an either or, it's a both and. Mm -hmm. So I think tech can continue to perform, but maybe on a relative basis underperform for some of these groups that are going to do well. So uh, we have two kind of themes. Number one is the dollar-based theme. The dollar weakening is going to be very positive for emerging market inflows and uh, international stock inflows. And they're just starting to break out global stocks ex-US relative to bonds, uh, which has been in a sideways channel for 10, 11, 12 years. Now they're starting to take off. So I think that's going to be a monster outperform trend not at the expense. It doesn't mean NVIDIA has to crash or Apple has to crash or Microsoft. It could just mean that th those consolidate, they perform less well, and then you start to see more and more flows into emerging markets. And I think you've got the dollar trade, but you also have the interest rate trade, uh, which is going to re be reflected, as Christina said, in banks as their loan books get better, as their balance sheets get better, as their funding costs get quantified. And a group that uh, no one loves, which is REIT, which is interest rate sen sensitive, could start to get a bid as well. But uh, we love the emerging markets. We love the China trade moving forward, which is a uh, uh, little hairy right now. But I think you're going to see some positive things in the second half. Christina, should investors be using a week like this week where we did see some downward uh, action in the market? Should they be using dips like this to buy? Absolutely. But um, just to key off the international conversation, they can't think just domestically. There are opportunities outside the U.S., and especially given that the dollar is likely to weaken as we go into the back half of this year, this is a time to be shopping selectively internationally. So some developed uh, international, but also in particular I'm excited about Asia EM. And part of it is that China reopening story, but you can play that um, with Chinese stocks or with some Asia EMs that are likely to benefit. We have to think about the China, uh, the China story is one in which they were closed for a lot longer than other major economies. That is a very coiled spring. And so this reopening has legs, and it's actually going to be helped along by what I think is going to be some significant stimulus from China, both monetary, we started to see that reduction in policy rates, um, but also some fiscal stimulus. All right, guys, as we wrap this up, we're going to go around the horn real quick, and I'll give you two options, either your top trade for the second half of the year or the number one data point that you will be watching that you think is so critical outside of inflation. We all know inflation is maybe the easy answer there. But what else are you watching? John, you first. Uh, I focus so heavily on the S&P because that is the benchmark. Mm -hmm. That's what everyone is based on. And that's responsible for most of your returns. Market does well. We all do well. So I'm watching very closely to see how the S&P reacts. And as excited as, as we are now, like everybody planted their flag and said 20%. We are now in a new bull market. I think everyone's saying that just in time for the summer slowdown. So I'd like to see around August, what does the market look like then? If we pull back, there may be some opportunities in the future. Christina? Um, two, Asia EM. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very excited right now about investment grade corporate bonds. Uh, we have to recognize this is a golden age of fixed income. We haven't talked about that, or we're pretty close to a golden age, after having gone through the pain of last year. Now that, that rates have risen significantly, there's an abundance of opportunities within fixed income. The one measure, the one metric I'm going to be most focused on, I mentioned this, Michigan consumer inflation expectations. I think it's critical. It's not technically inflation, but I think it's an important part of the Fed calculus. Tom? I think the biggest trade for relative outperformance for the second half is going to be emerging markets in China. Mm -hmm. I think the stimulus is going to be bigger than people expect, and I think it's, go it's not going to be a linear recovery when it actually kicks in and we see second quarter earnings. We just had the 618 holiday. We saw the retail sales up 14.8% for Alibaba. Uh, people are going to be surprised by that, and there's going to be a chase. Opinion follows trend. When price goes up, all the money is going to start to follow in. That's one. And I think the second laggard that I think is going to be a, a relative outperformance is going to be small caps. And uh, regional banks is, is a major part of that story. And I think you're going to start to see those get bid in the second half. And we're pretty excited about that. All right, guys, we've got to leave it there. This is a great all-star panel to wrap up. What has been a pretty eventful week here for the markets? Tom Hayes, Christina Hooper, and John Galliardi. Thanks so much for joining us here. That does it for us today on Yahoo Finance, but make sure you stick around 3 p.m. Eastern time. We've got all your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. We'll see you then. And we're back.
So that gives you a broad overview. And then last night I was on CGT in America with Phil Yin. And I uh, want to thank Phil and, of course, Tufik Gibran, who is an incredible producer, was helping me with my camera. We got to get the lighting going, but uh, I think we made some improvements there. So that was good to see for when we do remotes. And we're going to listen to this one because Phil always asks the best questions. So here we go. Uh, for more on how to make money, we're joined by Thomas Hayes, founder, chairman, managing member of Great Hill Capital. Good to see you. Um, the last few weeks, um, I will say I am perplexed because we had the non-rate hike. Then we had the talk of more rate hikes later. The market doesn't, doesn't, doesn't give a damn. It, it, it's been rallying almost every day. We're near new highs. Uh, the real estate market's rallying. Tech stocks are rallying, albeit a very small pullback. But it seems to me that investors are looking well beyond what two rate hikes are going to be. Is that a mistake? Uh, well, the two rate hikes are likely not going to happen. Thanks for having me, Phil. The economic data continues to blow by expectations, as you pointed out, with the Consumer Confidence Board. Consumer confidence is the highest it's been in 15 months now. You saw building permits higher than expected up 5.6% yesterday relative to negative uh, 1.4 last month. Uh, you saw new home sales up 12.2. People are just getting on with their lives. And uh, the thing that Powell said is he can remain restrictive just by keeping the Fed funds rate elevated for a period of time. So, uh, you know, he basically said the market can go up, the market can go down. We may do two, two months, we may do zero months. All we did was pause. So I think what he's trying to do is talk hawkish, act dovish, because he knows what most uh, astute mar market watchers know, which is owner's equivalent rent this month is going to come in uh, very low. It works on an 18-month lag. It deals with the deceleration in the increase in home prices 18 months later, and that's about uh, over a third of CPI, headline CPI. So if that's a live meeting, we get a weak headline number, you know, mid threes to low threes. I think this, they skip again, and that skip turns into a pause. That doesn't mean they're going to start cutting. The they're going to remain restrictive probably through the end of the year, if not beyond. The last couple of hours, we got these, um, these test results in from the bank stress tests, which uh, I was a little surprised. They all passed, it, it seemed to me. I, I, I guess if it was bad news, maybe they don't release the results, but it seemed to be good news. But these bank stocks, and I know you like a couple of them. I think you mentioned Bank of America in the past. They haven't done a darn thing for the last couple of months. Is it time they join the rally too? Yes, and that will happen after the end of the month. Uh, no one's going to change their positioning uh, before they print uh, the end of the month. I think that theme for the second half is going to be those stocks that have underperformed on a relative basis in the first half. So we had the Magnificent Seven up until about a month ago. They drove most of the gains. 90% of the bottom of the S&P 500 in aggregate were up 0%, even though the S&P was up double digits. I think that's going to shift in the second half as the dollar continues to weaken with the Fed out of the way. As bonds start to get bid and uh, rates get compressed, you're going to get a, a benefit, major benefit. I think REITs are a place to be. I think banks are, are a place to be. And I think uh, as a result of banks being a place to be, small caps are going to start to outperform on a relative basis. We, we had some news out of Delta. Uh, yeah. I think it was a day or two ago. And these airline stocks, um, they also haven't done a ton either. The airline stocks are moving. The travel stocks are moving. And what Delta, their CEO, basically said was that uh, this jump in demand that we're seeing in, for travel, uh, it's here to stay. And it might get even stronger. I mean, if that doesn't make you optimistic, I don't know what will. But these airline stocks are still very much hammered from when we had the pandemic. Most of them are still trading at, you know, 30 or 40 cents from where they were. Yeah, well, you know, the only sector that was almost as hated as tech was at the end of last year when we were hammered, pounding the table with you, let's go, it's time to buy tech, was consumer discretionary. And what we're seeing is that the consumer has jobs, and so long as the American consumer has jobs, they like to spend money. They, they bought everything off of Amazon uh, when they were locked up in their house during COVID. Now they want to get out and experience the world. They realize life is short. It's time to get on with living. You're seeing the cruise stocks. You're seeing the airline right. stocks.
The key with that is you got to just look at them one on a one by one basis and look at their balance sheets, make sure, sure they're not too over levered and have too much debt to refinance at higher rates. But beyond that, the theme is up. Well, look, we're, we're going to get earnings, I believe, from Nike uh, in the next day or so. And we should get a very good gauge of how healthy or unhealthy the U.S. consumer is because we hear from experts the recessions are coming, inflation's killing everybody, and things are terrible, and there's layoffs. But then there's this whole flip side of the news that you watch that things are strong, unemployment is low, people are buying houses, and people want to spend, I guess, $200 on, on Lululemon or Nike T-shirts. I don't know where they're getting this money from, but there's, there's something odd going on here with the consumer. Well, Nike's going to be as much of a story about the U.S. consumer as it's going to be about the Chinese consumer. And what we're seeing from the 618 holiday was that the volumes were pretty good. The ch Chinese consumer is slowly coming back. Keep in mind, uh, you've only been uh, unlocked from COVID zero for about you know less than less than half a year, and that consumer is rebuilding confidence. The economy is rebuilding confidence. Market participants are expecting there should be some meaningful stimulus in the back half of the year. So I think uh, Nike will be a, a interesting tell on the U.S. consumer, but a more interesting tell on the Chinese recovery. So we're looking forward to that report. <laughs> Uh, we're getting to my favorite part of this uh, the show with you, and that's when everybody gets their piece of paper and pencil out, because I'm going to ask you for three stock picks in 30 seconds. What do you got for us for the end of Ju uh, June? Oh, my goodness, 30 seconds. So you don't want to know why to buy them. You just want to know what to buy. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you what we own, and you can, you can do your own homework. Number one is PayPal. This, is, this one is completely left for dead. People think the competition from Apple Pay is going to be, be dangerous or the Fed now. The bottom line is they get 50 percent of their revenues abroad. So that weakening dollar is going to help them. They're trading at a, a third of their normal multiple 11 times earnings versus over 30 times historic. They're going to have a replacement of their CEO before the end of the year. That will be a catalyst. And you have Elliott Management in the stock. Generac, the most boring stock, 75 percent of the market for home standby generators. They were left for dead because they overstocked during COVID. That, that, that inventory troughed in the first quarter. They're starting to work through that. You're seeing the stock is up meaningfully. We started talking about it at around $101. It's up to 148. We think that's got another 100 bucks in it over the next 12 to 24 months. Uh, so we like that. And then, of course, we love our emerging markets. We just got to get past the, this end of the month, get the Fed out of the way, dollar weakens, emerging markets, China is a buy. Tom, good to see you, my friend. As always, thanks so much. Chaos. And we're back. So thanks again to them. I also want to thank Shruti Shankar and Johan Cherian for including me in their Reuters article this morning, as well as Chavi Mehta, Mike Spector, Joseph White, Dietrich Kunneth, Ben Blanchard, and Sarah Wu for including me in their article on Reuters earlier in the week as well. And we're going to move to our famous Justin Mammoth sentiment cycle chart because... Um, uh, you know if Bob has moved or it hasn't moved based on the questions you get for Ask Me Anything uh, each week. But what I want to lay out with this is just getting people present to what a bottoming process looks like. And I know that, um, you know, not a lot of high quality professionals that take long term uh, commitments to positions um are willing to share their information and, and share their knowledge uh, as we've done and i i literally just uh do it on the basis of if warren buffett didn't share what he learned and ben graham didn't share what he learned i wouldn't have a career so i feel like it's an obligation although very few people do it and i share this just to put it in context because for the average investor they're they're always worried about what's going to happen next tomorrow or next week or next month um and you know the beautiful thing of these stocks that go up a few times multi-baggers as we like to call them is some have some do happen relatively quickly like cooper standards already up 3x in you know just over a year and that thing's just getting started uh, Generac is now taking off. We've been talking about that. And we only started talking about that in March uh, because we had all the new money come in and we had to put money to work. And that was one of the positions. Um, we started talking about that, I think, around 101. It's 149 already um, and probably got another 100 bucks in it. So uh, the key thing about this process here 
is you get your first flush, your panic, and that's kind of like what we refer to as the um, left shoulder, okay? And this is a technical pattern that's, uh, you know, you don't make the bets on the basis of it, but when the business stops trading in relation to fundamentals due to some exogenous headlines or uh, temporary um, uh, nonsense, you can use this as a guide for sentiment. So you have your left shoulder, which is panic. You have your head, which is the flush low, which is discouragement. Discouragement. Then you shoot all the way up uh, back to uh, um, you know breaking out here, and um, everyone gets nervous. This is usually where money starts jumping in, and then they get flushed out, and they stay back down in aversion for a little while, which is what we call the right shoulder. So left shoulder head right shoulder you know looks like uh inverse head and shoulders and then finally you work your way back up to denial you get some consolidation back up here at the breakout level because this is where all the volume is and then once it gets through here it just goes straight up and and the the interesting thing about it is between here and here usually the fundamentals don't change very much because here you are paying too much for the same fundamentals uh, here, you are paying way too little for the same fundamentals. Um, and then, you know, buy here and here, maybe the fundamentals start to improve a little bit. But once you get up to here, people are paying too much again, but they're doing it because they feel like everyone else is doing it. And it's the herd mentality. So why am I spending three minutes on this one yet again? The reason is, is remember, shoulder, head, shoulder, and this is the breakout level. Well, what's Baba done in the last week? Because I must have eight questions on Alibaba. You know, one of which is, uh, when would you give up on Alibaba? Which is the same question we got last week. So let's, so we know what sentiment is. Let's look at what price is. So all of the questions in the last few weeks around Baba have been very negative. But what has actually changed? And this is what's important. Here we are with the left shoulder, which was put in in last uh, March, okay? Then you had this move back up here. Then you had the flush all the way down to discouragement in October when the stock got down to $58 and people were puking hand over fist. We bought a slug at $61. And then what happened? At 121, everyone was excited. The thing went up 100% after the dollar peaked and started to come down, it went up 100% in three months. And that's what I say, when it comes, it comes all at once. And sure enough, that was enough to suck everyone in who sold at $60, uh, you know, they probably bought in here in the hundreds, they, they flushed out at 58 and $60, then they're like, oh my God, I missed it. They bought back up after it was up 100%. And those people have to get flushed because as you can see, there was a tremendous amount of volume at that level. Look here at volume by price. So now what's happened? Well, we're putting in the right shoulder, okay? Just as the left shoulder was sloppy, you had two moves to make the shoulder. The right shoulder is sloppy and you have two moves to make that. <clears throat> but in the scheme of things, the, business, the, the price of the stock has done absolutely nothing since last March. And it's following the normal shakeout process, shoulder, head, shoulder, to get everyone out. And right now, the fact that everyone is panicking once yet again at the exact wrong time, I think we're literally on the cusp of this. Now, the other thing you have to keep in mind is, just like you're seeing Cooper Standard get bid up into the end of the quarter, uh, because it's done well this quarter, so people are chasing and pushing it up into the into the close, so they get their marks high. Um, you're seeing the same with Alibaba, which hasn't worked this quarter. No one wants it on their books before the 30th of June. So after you come home from the 4th of July holiday and you play plenty of great golf and shoot your best rounds ever, you'll come back and there'll be some ridiculous headline out of Hong Kong or China that the Chinese government has elected to buy stocks or the Chinese government has elected to uh, offer tax incentives for individuals to put stocks in a retirement plan, a tax advantaged account. Or you'll hear, um, uh, you know, we'll get the inflation data in the US, which, uh, you know, with a headline of mid threes 
and everyone will know the Fed is finally done, the dollar will shoot lower, and emerging markets will all get bid. So this is not unique to Alibaba. The reason we chose Alibaba is because Alibaba has the best underlying fundamentals, and um, we know we have a margin of safety, but you could put emerging markets in the same chart, the EEM, you could put KWEB in the same chart, uh, KWEB, you could put Tencent, all the charts are pretty much exactly the same thing. And um, the difference is, we think we have the highest quality business of all of the, the businesses available in the emerging markets. And this is where we are in the process. So for those of you who are not happy because it's June 29th, and it's probably going to look like crap tomorrow on June 30th as well, uh, just know where you are, step back, zoom out, and know this process repeats over and over and over as long as you have a good quality business. So um, my bet is of the six or seven questions that I got, I'm going to bet that three to four of them have done exactly the opposite of what we've taught on this podcast for the last four years, which is they have gone in on margin. And if they've done that, then shame on them. And, uh, you know, the, you can't be any clearer. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. You buy high quality businesses, but if you're levered up on them, then then it's on you um, and probably levered up at the exact wrong time at 120. Now they're bleeding here and hopefully they can hang on if we retouch 80 before we blast off to 120 and beyond. Uh, and then finally through 120, which is when we start to go straight up. So that's where that is. So hang tight. Nothing's changed. If anything, the uh, 618, the volumes were up 14.8%. We're seeing other headlines, which we'll go through right now. The business has gotten better. The price has done nothing. And it's what we call a coiled spring. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, mark my words, and I've had enough words over the last three years with different companies and different stocks. When I say something, in many cases sooner, and in some cases like this one later, it plays out and it plays out as expected. So um, this this thing is a coiled spring. Now, I want to put this guy on. Uh, I thought he had a good short clip here. He's from Joe Nagai from McKinsey, China. Uh, laying out the case for China in the face of, uh, you know, uh, renewed pessimism again, because remember, opinion follows trend. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking about making baseball hats that say hedge fund tips on the front and opinion follows trend on the back. Maybe we'll do that. Um, but uh, uh, here we go. Let's let's take a listen to this. Uh, Joseph Nagai from McKinsey, China. So I think it really depends on whether you're a glass half full person or a glass half empty person, right? I think on the glass half empty side, I'll go there first. I think you look at all the challenges that China has, right? In terms of right now, there's a bit of overcapacity, right? A lot of the export sectors are quite hit by, you know, a slowing world economy. I think you look at the capacity of, you know, residential, you know, real estate and others. The margin compression right now is really being felt by all businesses, right? So I think if you take all these problems that China has and put it all in the short term and feel like, hey, when's that going to be resolved? I think you can actually have a quite pessimistic view. And I think that's a little bit of what a lot of businesses expecting coming out of COVID. The big rebound is not happening, right? So that's a kind of glass half empty view. On the other hand, 18% of global GDP today in China, growing 5% this year, it's a third of global growth, right? I think from that perspective, there's no other economy of this size that's growing at this pace. So on that side, you know, many of the macro factors that we love about China is still very much present. So if you look at that perspective, I do think that China still represents probably one of the most unique markets for anyone operating in the global economy today. Mm. It's very important to put it into context, particularly when you look at the contribution to global growth, as you have pointed out there. But when you lift up the hood and you take a look at where those growth drivers are actually coming from, what are you seeing? Because Goldman Sachs, of course, saying that China perhaps doesn't want to rely on the old playbook of the property sector anymore. Um, we're seeing the stimulus coming through, but investors seem to be disappointed um, with the lack of specifics around that. Yeah, look, I think that we need the consumption in China to come back up, right? In the last few years, China's Chinese uh, savers have saved up 33 trillion of RMB, right, in deposit savings. 
um, more than ever before, right? If you look at a lot of the banks today, um, you see that you know, uh, residents of China are actually uh, repaying their mortgages, right? So the deleveraging on the, on the consumption side is actually happening. What we need there is a little bit of a confidence, right? Where people are willing to spend again, where they feel like you know there is going to be a little bit more optimism, right, in the market. And I do think that you know I hope the consumption will come back more. The other one I think is very interesting is that China is still very much at this stage of innovation and technology, um, you know, uh, driven e economy. So if I look at you know electric vehicles, if I look at you know solar and other sustainability, right? If I look at even um, recently, a lot of Chinese exports, right, going actually outside in terms of technology. I mean, you know, the, the interesting thing is that in the past few months, the top three apps in the U.S. downloaded are all Chinese, right? So I think that there is quite a lot going on in there, and I think that that is really being discounted by the market right now. And we're back. Okay, so moving along, this was from uh, Brendan Ahern over at uh, um Crane Shares, who runs the K-Web ETF, which is the China Internet ETF. And he made some an interesting find here. He said, quote, a mainland media spokesperson publicly mentioned buying Chinese stocks for the first time yesterday in an interesting move. Um, as noted in yesterday's note, several prominent economists publicly discussed the need for more stimulus. This doesn't occur often as it's feasible that policymakers are getting the message. So this would be huge. And if you remember, this is what the Bank of Japan has been doing. Uh, and effectively, you know, if you saw the meeting with Powell from Portugal yesterday, uh, when they were asked if they coordinate and they snickered, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we talk. They do a lot more than talking. The basis right now is that Lagarde will withdraw liquidity from Europe because they have the worst inflation, um, while Japan pumps liquidity into the global economy through continuing to print money and buy securities. And as a matter of fact, Japan has now become the largest holder of treasuries over China uh, as a result of them becoming the lender of last resort. But this is a quid pro quo. And the quid pro quo is if you buy our bonds and you provide global liquidity, we'll help you, number one, get inflation above 2%. And number two, uh, weaken the yen so that you can become a more competitive exporter, uh, particularly against your number one export competition, which is China. We will give you that edge. So um, I think China is going to get fear of loss. And this is not dissimilar to what I said, that if the U.S. car companies didn't start making this, the small sedans again, he, Hyundai and Kia and Toyota were going to flood the market and leave them in the dust. We're going to show you in a second that they, they've got the message and now car volumes are going up across the board because they're not just producing the big trucks that they make the largest margin. They're now trying to defend their share as all these other producers have just been flood, flooding the market, which has been a boon for Tesla. The thing that people don't talk about EVs is Tesla met a demand that the regular producers gave up on in the ICE business. They didn't produce small cars anymore. So the only place you could buy a small economical car was from Tesla, more or less. And, uh, and, and that's exactly what's happening. And the same thing is going to be true for China. If they don't start stimulating, they're going to lose share to Japan. Japan's going to eat their lunch and it's, it's game on. So uh, China needs stimulus and clearer rules. Ex-IMF official says PBOC ready to act forcefully if economy stumbles. The economy is not stumbling. That's the problem. It's actually growing. Um, and for those of people who say, oh, my God, they're only going to grow at 5.2 or 5.4 percent this year. I mean, think about that. We just printed 2 percent GDP growth in Q1. They've been locked down for three years and they're, they're printing five plus, um, you know, that old dog don't hunt and wait till they catch up in the second half. And you see those numbers come in higher than expected and everyone panic buys just like they're panic buying NVIDIA and all the tech companies now after they've already had their run. They're going to be panic buying uh, Alibaba and Tencent and others uh, when they're back up at $180. And uh, first, at a, well, at 120, they won't believe it again. At 180 is when they'll start to believe it again. 
and then we'll get our next consolidation up there. So um, that's your preview of coming attractions. So China's smartphone shipments back to double digit growth in May. You know, you never hear anyone talking about this stuff. Uh, you never hear anyone talking about the volumes increasing in uh, 618. But sooner or later, that's all everyone will be talking about. Uh, but the smart people know Citadel's Ken Griffith op optimistic on growth in China. Um, on the US front, uh, 3M uh, got that settlement at 10.3 billion. So that's really good for the forever chemicals. Now we'll see some progress on the uh, earplugs, which if you remember, the Defense Department came out and said there was no material difference between the soldiers who did use their earplugs and didn't use their earplugs as it relates to their ability to hear. That will be proven or disproven uh, in court. And most likely, as in the case of PFAS, we'll see a settlement at much lower amounts than, than the market anticipated. And uh, we spent a lot of time on that in, I think, last week's about dividend or no dividend. So uh, we'll leave it at that. Car prices aren't going down. Automakers are just finally building something other than expensive trucks. So here's the article. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, one of the guys I was playing golf with this week just bought a Ford Raptor, um, Ford Raptor F-150 or something like that. And um, he's like, uh, you know, I was just going to buy it. And they said that we have 0.9% financing. So it was an absolute no brainer. I bought one and I asked them what else they had for my wife. And, and that's, that's what you're going to get in a used car environment where financing is 9%. Uh, and the new car dealers start offering, you know, 0.9% or 1.9% or uh, whatever it happens to be. Uh, with the average car at 13.7 years old on the road, uh, these are going to start flying like hotcakes. And that's why you're seeing Cooper Standard start to price that in. But it, it really hasn't even begun yet. And we're going to continue to see this play out. Like I said, sooner or later, the things that I say tend to play out. And, um, you know, in many cases, it's sooner. In some cases, it's later. But the key is all you can control is your process of estimating value. The, mar the price and the emotions of the market are going to do what they do, but sooner or later, that short-term emotional voting machine uh, uh, based on headlines is going to turn into a long-term fundamental weighing machine based on the ability to generate cash. And that's really all it comes down to. Uh, PacWest stock rises on new optimism about troubled regional banks. So the lender announced another asset sale as it recovers from the industry chaos in the spring. And what we're finding across the board, whether it's Pacific West Bank Corp, or PayPal selling their buy now, pay later assets in um, Europe to KKR for $40 billion, which is going to increase their buyback, by the way, is that uh, these assets that everyone thinks are worth uh, 60 cents on the dollar are turning out to be worth a lot more than 60 cents on the dollar. And when people figure that out, there's going to be panic buying for those assets. And, um, and by the way, it's not dissimilar to, to me. Uh, I thought during the in uh, during the pandemic in 2020 i was trying to buy a uh, hotel in the permian basin because uh this was when oil went to negative 30 and i was like this is an absolute home run uh this is a levered way to play energy and uh, the thing was like uh it had traded at like four and a half million bucks or something. I think it was a Holiday Inn Express. And they were asking like 2.1. And it was pretty new. It was like five years. So I didn't have to do, I, I might've had to do a pip for like one and a half million or something like that. And uh, I thought I was going to be able to get the thing for a million, 1.5, 1.3. Cause I thought that, um, you know, it would be more distressed and it would take a lot, lot longer for drilling to come back. And et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I had no problem buying the stocks down a ton because I knew that they would discount the recovery faster, but the hotels were more liquid. The long story short is, you know, it never hit anywhere close to my bid. I think it, I think it sold for like three, five. Uh, and uh, the peak price was like four, four, one. There was never any distress, even in the most distressed area of the country, which was oil. And if, if you think that sounds, if you lived and invested through 2020, 
No one wanted to buy oil when we were we were pounding the tables to buy Exxon. I think it was at thirty five dollars or something like that. So um, the same thing, I believe, is going to happen with many of the higher quality assets right now. Everyone that was calling for a recession everyone was calling for the consumer to fall off a cliff. Uh, all these assets that people think are worth 50 and 60 cents on the dollar, whether it's commercial, a, a, a property commercial, uh, or these buy now pay later loans, or the uh, loans on the books of these regional banks, uh, are going to be surprised because they're going to have their bid in and they're going to miss it and it's going to go up against them. Very similar to all the large hedge fund uh, figureheads who came on the TV in October of last year and told you to sell at the market lows. Uh, because the market was going another 20% lower after it was down 27% uh, and that and that marked the bottom. So that's all you need to know. Jeffrey signals green shoots in Wall Street's investment banking lull. Um, this is uh, speaks to what I said about Kava on Yahoo about two weeks ago. The game was on. Now you're seeing that flow. There was a couple I, there were a couple IPOs today as well. So the game is back on and just getting started. That is. Uh, good stuff. These four indicators suggest that the U.S. is headed for the promised land of a rolling economic expansion. Uh, this is from Ed Yardeni. He points to the housing market. New home sales are rocketing uh, this week. Manufacturing sector, you can see here, the uh, uh, composite PMIs are turning back up. Uh, that's what you see after a recession, which I told you last last year, we already had the technical recession that everyone's waiting for as they keep pounding their table on the yield curve, the yield curve, the yield curve. Um, it's rear view mirror. So consumer confidence is turning up this week. That shocked everyone much higher than expected. And then finally, signs of disinflation, which uh, you don't need a microscope to see. Uh, prices paid, prices received. It's completely rolling over back to the flat line. So uh, that's all positive. Legendary value investor Seth Klarman says he's looking at real estate as the next big opportunity ahead of the slowdown in the economy. So he's been looking at commercial real estate, okay? And that's where he sees pockets of dislocation. And, um, and uh, we kind of beat him to the punch there with Vernado as it starts to trade up. Moving along, but he'll do some stuff in the private market. Public markets discount it much sooner than the private markets. Here is Steve Roth, the best operator in the history of the business. And okay, so somehow, uh, this is not letting me stop using this pen. Just trying to move this out of the way. Let's see. Oh, exit drawing. There we go. New York landlord Bernardo bets a billion dollars that more commuters will return. So while everyone's running for the hills, he's doubling down. That's what made him the greatest in the in commercial real estate in New York City. And that's what's going to keep him as the greatest in, in commercial real estate in New York City. And that's why the stock is starting to move. Our, official, our office REITs on sale. A lot of upside. This is from Financial Times. Uh, Robert Armstrong is the author. And he basically makes the same case that we made in the article three weeks ago where we walked through, this is what he shows as consensus estimates for funds from operations for Boston Properties, Vernado and SL Green. And he talks about that those revenues being cyclical, not secular in terms of it's not a secular downturn and he's looking at estimates. So the trough was actually in Q1 of this year for funds from operations and now they're turning up. And, uh, and that's, that's exactly when we were buyers. And we're gonna see more of that. And then we're gonna see people panic buying after a double and we'll lay off after it's a triple. So, um, you know, the vacancy rates, you know, these stocks are down 75, 80%. And in Manhattan, uh, in the A properties, you have a 10% vacancy rate as of Q1, which was the trough. So uh, that's all you need to know. Moving on, this was a huge trade this week. SL Green shares surge after selling half of a New York City building at $2 billion valuation. This was um, 245 Park Avenue, which is where Vornado is, uh, all in that area, the highest A-class properties. And they sold it, uh, just to give you an idea of that valuation, it's barely a discount to the 
$1.1 billion that China's H&A Group to acquire the building at its peak in 2017 uh, when New York City commercial real estate property was at its peak. So the other thing you need to keep in mind, if you remember from the late 80s when Japan was flying, um, they were overpaying for Rockefeller Center and we were just selling it to them. We were just like sold to you, you know, all day long. Uh, and, you know, you, you remember the movie The Rising Sun and China, Japan was going to take over the world. It's the same story now. So when China's H&A paid $2.21 billion, they overpaid by orders of magnitude. So the fact that we've just gone through the pandemic and, and all these people work from home and all the pessimism and it still trades at $2 billion after the Chinese overpaid at the peak uh, is, is unbelievable to me. And, and it's shocking people. And that's why the entire group is up. And as I said, these assets are, are not going to, uh, they're not going to mark down. It's going to be like the, the schmo trying to buy the Holiday Inn Express in the Permian Basin during the oil depression in 2020. The, the marks just never came. Um, if anything, they're going to be much higher than, than the peak marks in a very short period of time. And that's what's going to shock everyone. I'm not saying that's true for BNC properties, but I know the properties that I own. Uh, as an owner of Vernado, as a partner alongside Steve Roth. So legendary investment Seth Klarman uh, outlines the key traits needed to become a successful investor. So there's uh, quite a few young people that listen, focused on blocking out the noise. We talk about that all the time. Valuation, one of the critical things about long-term return from investing is that it depends on the entry price. So if you enter when the market's very expensive at a high valuation, you may be disappointed because you might match the index, but the index may not, not do very well. Staying invested, not getting distracted when you get uh, situations like this, not getting distracted through all this, because eventually you get this. If you did your work up front, you won the war before you even stepped into battle. Uh, then you just wait through all of that. And then finally, um, having conviction, well, then we don't lack for that. And finally, focusing on what matters uh, and looking for pockets of uh, inefficiency, which is what we always focus to do. Now, uh, bearish treasury bets could make a comeback to bite hedge funds. I'll tell you, Carlton, Carlton English, number one, she's the best bank reporter in the business period over and out. But uh, she, you always want to, she just has her finger on what's happening at all times. That's why I love Barron's. And um, she's absolutely right, because what you can see here is the red line is hedge funds and large traders are the most short that they've been, uh, you know, in the 23 years that this chart has. So they're the shortest uh, the 10 year note than they've ever been, 10 year treasury than they've ever been. The only time they came close to being this short was in 2018. And uh, each time that they got that short, and meanwhile, commercials are buying hand over fist. And what happens when commercials buy? Uh, they buy, they're early, they're always early and they're always right, kind of like Tom Hayes. <laughs> I, no one's always anything, but uh, odds on. And um, um, here you go. We're going to get a rally in treasuries the second half, uh, just like you did in 2018, just like you got this bounce here in 2017 just like you got here in 14. Uh, and it just goes on and on. Commercials are the smart money and they buy ahead. And then um, here in last time they were this short was the bottom. So history will be no different. They're gonna get their faces ripped off as they realize that Powell's gonna keep talking uh, two more hikes uh, forever, as long as the market lets him. The market's already stopped listening to him, but they're gonna keep, he's going to keep talking that, and they're going to keep wondering why he keeps skipping and pausing. And then uh, someone uh, sooner or later, someone's going to send them what I've been saying for the last year and a half, which is we have 120% debt to GDP. They have to inflate it away. The only way they can do that is through running nominal nominal GDP high. The only way they can do that is to run inflation three to five percent for the next three to five years. Um, and that's it. If they go down to two percent, we're going to have one hundred forty percent GDP, and we're going to be we're going to have a lot of problems. We're going to become Japan, and they're not going to do that. So, uh, banks pass Fed stress test. Now the focus is dividends. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'll tell you if if Citibank, I've been I, I just keep looking at this this business. 
if Citibank ever changes their CEO, I'm pro it's probably going to become a 15 or 20% position overnight. Um, she's just not skilled. I mean, she's just not getting the job done. End of story. Uh, so um, we'll wait for that. But that's, an, uh, you know, we have the KRE long dated options, which we talked about. I think they're up 40, 50%, which is pretty awesome. And um, um, this one would be an amazing long term holding if they could get the leadership right. All right, next, the Russell 2000 should beat the S&P 500 if it can overcome these three headwinds. So this is in line with what we've said uh, on Yahoo on Friday. Number one, rising rates. Well, that's going to get taken care of, uh, if not at the July meeting, the one after. But I think it's going to be July because the inflation print's coming beforehand. And that'll give them cover to, quote unquote, skip one more time, uh, which will lead to the permanent pause. Economic growth. Um, we saw today 2% GDP, much higher than expected. And sector composition, which is basically regional banks, real estate, and biotech. Oh, by the way, we love all three of those, and that's why we want exposure there. Move, moving along, burdened by the facts, stock market, and sentiment. Just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Uh, I know the saying. I don't really know the origin of that saying. I think it's some like detective show, but this is the guy who said it. And... Um, Okay, so we went through the second half playbook with Yahoo. This chart from Goldman uh, signals the same thing that uh, we're looking for. Russell 2000 should rise by 14% during the next 12 months. You could probably double that. Uh, according to a simple model based on U.S. economic growth and starting valuations that explained roughly two-thirds of Russell 2000 returns between 1995 and 2015. So you can see how their modeled number uh, uh, matched the tracking. Of course, this is always in, in uh, looking with the rearview mirror, but I think all conditions point to uh, what they're looking for. Moving along, we talked about, uh, well, you already heard the fill thing, positioning. Now, the purpose of the following charts and tables is to remind skeptics that the data continues to come in better than expected. While the back half of the year returns for the indices may, not, may be more muted than the first half, there's still significant opportunity. However, the most money will be made, quote, under the surface with dozens of individual laggards that can be up 20, 30, 50, even 100 percent plus in second half uh, positioning. Now, commercials are still long. The S&P 500 and the Russell and the Nasdaq and the uh, Dow, while hedge funds are short the whole way up. Uh, we continue to follow the commercials and ignore the large managers who told you to sell at the October lows. So you can see here they're long. And the market continue, you know, while the hedge funds are short, they've been short the entire way up. They've missed 25%. And when commercials are always early and they're always right, and they're they're still aggressively record long, which is what happens after that first spike uh, in big long-term multi-year rallies. So uh, regional equity allocation, you can see here allocation to equities. Um, uh, current allocation is 1.2 standard deviations below its long-term average. That sets the stage for more of the panic chase. Sentiment is still in the hole. This is literally from a week ago, ladies and gentlemen. Even after the market is up 22% or whatever off the October lows, sentiment and positioning is still in the gutter, which means there are plenty of bricks and mortar to climb the wall of worry. Um, profit expectations are still in the toilet, which is perfect because that's the fuel to get these monster recovery rallies. The bull and bear indicator Bank of America um, is uh, still neutral. It's not even getting started uh, towards where you'd want to be looking to take off uh, a lot of stocks. It's it's still very skeptical, very pessimistic. Up here is when you start to want to say, okay, what 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 what's already doubled or tripled that maybe could get another half turn, but I'm not willing to risk it. Let's let's lay off some or all. Uh, we're not near those levels. Consumer confidence blew the doors off 109.7 1 versus 104 forecast up from 102 last print. This is the highest in 15 months. Uh, and then you see here we still have record money markets held by households, uh, deposits in money markets. All this, uh, a good portion of this can come back into the market. Maybe 10, 20 percent is trillions of dollars. So um, money supply, uh, as we all know, has contracted a lot in the last year. That's going to help inflation. However, in the last three months, it started to go up. 
uh, which is a key, key thing. And uh, Seth uh, Golden has sent this over from Luthold Group, who published this chart. When M2 starts to rise, the average return uh, year on year for the S&P is 14.2% versus when it's falling like last year, uh, the average return is only 2.7%. So we're moving into the above average return period of time based on money supply. And this cyclical model is from Larry Williams. He did this on timing solution. Uh, we have timing solution as well. We don't use it uh, too much. We used to use it a lot more and then realized that if you pick the right businesses sooner or later, they always revert back to intrinsic value. So you don't have to pay attention to all these quiggly lines. But this one is pretty timely because it points to money supply turning up. And when money supply turns up, equities follow in spades. Uh, earnings expectations, the setup going into earnings in the next couple of weeks is beautiful. It's exactly like Q1, where uh, people anticipated uh, earnings would be negative 6.5%. And instead, they were close to flatline, I think about negative 2% or slightly better than that. Uh, I think we're going to have a similar setup this quarter where expectations, and that's probably confirmed by the above average, uh, above expected GDP that we saw today. I think we're going to see uh, rather than getting negative 6.5, you wind up with negative 1 or negative 2. Everyone's blindsided, guidance starts to go up, and, uh, and you get uh, some more panic buying into midsummer. Analysts playing catch up on buy ratings, so opinion follows trends. So they all were downgrading in the hole, and now they've got to upgrade to chase. Uh, economic data, the PMI is turning up. We covered that already. Durable goods blew the doors off. This is this is not levels of a non-defense capital goods orders that you see um, during a recession. Okay, at a recession like in 2020, they collapse. When you're just starting the expansion is when they get up to these levels and then it persists for another four to five years. If you look at 96, 97, and then 2005, 2006, and then 2011, 2012, and now we're just recovering from the COVID lows uh, for the first time and that bodes well for the coming years. Uh, other points with inflation, uh, while uh, the Fed keeps pounding the table on 2%, it's likely that they'll revise their target to 3%. That's in Seth's opinion. I don't think they'll ever formally revise that, but I think that's their unspoken target. And I think that's what they need to do to bring debt to GDP down. Uh, keep in mind, the economy performed well from 1982 to 1990 with an average CPI of 5.1% over the decade. So that's something that people forget when they only look at recency bias. Uh, if you step back a little bit 30, 40 years ago, you find that uh, a high growth, high nominal growth uh, environment uh, can withstand 5.1% inflation and the Fed can continue to cut rates in that type of environment. And that's exactly what happened during the boom, boom 80s. Uh, surprise, you're not in a recession. The U.S. economic data has delivered the most positive surprises since 2021. So we're going straight up. Uh, inflation expectations continue to be at the lows not seen since 2009. Uh, new home sales are surging. And then seasonality, July has been the best month of the year uh, for the last nine times in July. Uh, not nine out of 10 times, nine out of the 10 last years, stocks have been up in July and it's been on average the best month of the year at plus 3.3%. That's from Ryan Dietrich. Over at the Carson Group, other people calling for the NASDAQ being overbought. But if you look at this data from, I think it's from Ari, uh, Ari Wald, um, when it comes off these uh, subdued levels and, and the 20 day deviation, the distance above its uh, 200 day moving average. Uh, is not an overbought in the first thrust out of the collapse. And that was one of the key things that I kept pounding the table on in 2020. It got quote unquote overbought. And I said that this is where people get screwed is that yes, it's overbought, but when you're coming out of the heart attack, it stays overbought and it stays pinned for a little while until it's gotten every last one in. And looking at the cash levels and the positioning, it hasn't even gotten close to getting people in. People are still in too much cash. Because if you remember, every single commentator for the first half of this year and the last half of last year was saying, why would I buy stocks when I could just sit back and collect 5%? And if you remember, I said, they're right. 
why would you buy stocks? So when everyone's on one side of the boat, what's going to cause the most pain? And what I said was going to cause the most pain is if the stock market rallies and their stock locked up in their six month treasuries and the market goes up 10, 15, 20%, that's how they feel pain. And that's the risk. They left 15%, 20% net on the table that passed them by that they'll never get back. That was maximum pain. And, um, and it's no different right now with everyone being short bonds, maximum pain is bonds get bid. So expect that to happen. Uh, here is the presidential cycle, which we've covered from all star charts. It shows that the trend continues to be up. You know, last year is the weakest year of the cycle. We get a monster rally into uh, second and third quarter of the pre-election year. Then we grind a little bit and grind into the election, but in an upward tra trajectory. And, and, uh, and that's why I'm talking about the magic happening under the surface. But even with this, I think we've got a lot of catch up here because we haven't fully followed that pattern, which, uh, which leads me to believe here after the Fed is fully out in July, that people are going to really get the message and seeing earnings and they're going to have to play catch up to this type of kind of uh, strong move that you usually see in the pre-election pre cycle. Uh, this is from Fundstrat. It shows that when you have labor sh shortages, the investment in tech goes parabolic and the stocks go parabolic. And we're in the same part of the sweet spot right now. So for everyone saying, you know, you want to be fully out of tech now, they've gotten too much. I, I don't think that's the case. I think we're the model that we've been looking at is similar to, and we've been talking about for now a year, is um, uh, more like the 95 to 99 model. And uh, AI, there's some hype to it, just like there was some hype to the internet, but there's a lot of substance to how it's gonna revolutionize our lives, revolutionize business, and not just for the AI companies, but for boring companies that produce goods and manufacture stuff and all kinds of things. So um this tech uh, the right tech companies which is why we own alphabet which is why we own amazon and which is why we own the most important uh ai company in the world in our view which is alibaba um are going to do exceptionally well during this period moving along uk continues to be hated um <clears throat> we continue to have our, our two holdings there uh in bigger size is rolls royce which is now up uh it's probably close to doubled in the last year or so. Uh, and then uh, ASOS hasn't done anything yet. Well, it's starting to move a little bit, but that's a smaller position anyway. Uh, we'd like to get some more exposure to the UK because you don't get um, these type of valuations very often in an investing career. So we keep our eyes open in the UK. And then finally, banks. Uh, the case for banks, uh, banks underperforming. You haven't seen an opportunity like that uh, in a long time to buy banks. So. Now on to the shorter term view for the general markets. Uh, sentiment is still elevated at 41% bullish. We think it can stay pinned for a while because of how people are positioned. Same thing with the fear and greed index. And managers, while they've got 83% equity exposure, they're not, not near triple digits. I think they can be forced higher uh, in the coming month, especially when everyone's now looking for a pullback after a quote unquote uh, getting overextended. Uh, earnings, you look at the... ARC Fund, which is Kathy Wood. This is pretty interesting. Her top 20 ratings and uh, her top 20, top 30 holdings, earnings estimates for the next uh, uh, top, in the last 60 days, the 2023 earnings estimates for the top 30 holdings have gone up 17.51%. I've never seen that big of a jump in a sector um since we've been doing this so i'm not saying by arc but i'm saying her 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 main fund believe it or not this is just a function of risk on so um her fund play, trades very closely with biotech as an index when risk is on and um so we think a better way to play this is 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 the biotech position which which is a, a major position for us um and we think we're going to see in the back half. I think Kathy will do fine. And I think biotech is going to do exceptionally well because their 2024 estimates have risen by 74% uh, in the last 60 days. So risk is coming back on. Things are much better than people expect. And they're going to have to panic chase, buy up, 
and uh, and this is a symptom of it. But no one sees that now. And just like we were saying with consumer discretionary in January, in uh, December, when everyone was telling you to buy oil, um, uh, I think it's the same is going to be with ARC and, and more importantly, biotech. Biotech is going to be a monster the second half. Uh, oil and gas equipment services, what's happening? Their estimates are going down, negative 10.36% for 2023, negative 7% for 2024 for the top 30 weights in the last 60 days. Uh, looking at some economic data, building permits, much higher than expected, 5.6 versus 5.2. Uh, key is they're just gonna build smaller houses. We talked about this was gonna happen last year, uh, but the, the uh, blueprint would be like Levittown, 2,000 square foot houses. Not every 30 year old needs to live in a 5,000 square foot house. And, uh, and that's coming to pass and the DHIs and the Pulteys and the KBs are filling that need. Uh, building permits are up, so they're not just uh, selling a bunch of new ones, they're building a bunch of new ones, that's good for the economy. Uh, consumer confidence is up. New home sales is through the roof, up 12.2% uh, versus up 3.5% last print. So, uh, and then this morning, you saw the GDP for Q1 came in at 2.1% versus 1.4 estimated. Uh, continuing claims came in better than estimated. Uh, core PCE prices came in lower than estimated, 4.9 versus 5.0 expected, and initial jobless claims came in lower than expected, 2.39 versus 2.66, uh, which is um, which it, which uh, you know it continues to to prove out. Moving along, we've got uh, C. Marshall asked, "Hi Tom, thanks for all you do. Uh, we're now on to the Ask Me Anything questions." Uh, always appreciate checking in on your opinions regarding your interest in CPS. I thought I would add some interesting analysis I picked up in my recent work around EVs and EV charging infrastructure. Key takeaway for an investment in CPS are similar. Settled low EV penetration is rapidly growing in the U.S. The length of car replacement cycles mean that this growth takes significant time to flow through the overall park. See below. Given the amount of information in the investment presentation that you covered in detail, there seems to be a, like a potentially very exciting benefit to the wider investment idea. It's clearly a long way to run, and if CPS is truly well positioned to take advantage over the long term, it could be huge. Um, also interested to know whether you've thought about any of the specifics of charging infrastructure rollout, either as components or installation, versus the rollout of EVs. Charging infrastructure globally has a long way to go to support electrification goals. Governments are setting for themselves. We can use the EU as a board guide on the adoption. Uh, obviously, there's a host of regulatory and policy tailwinds that'll support this growth in coming years. Is this something which you consider dipping your toes? Or are you laser focused on EV, EV platforms themselves? I'm not in, in uh, laser focused on anything related to EV. My thesis in Cooper Standard is predicated exclusively on returning ICE production volumes towards the 2017 levels, and we don't even need to hit that to hit our earnings number that we're looking for. EVs is just this free option, the whipped cream on the Sunday, that they ha they happen to get 20% more margin per vehicle uh, on, on EVs than they do on ICEs, which means we could do 20% less volume and earn the same amount that we earned in 2017, which was over $7 a share in earnings, which at that time commanded a 20 times multiple, which is why you had $146 stock. If we did... Um, um, you know, 20% EVs, you know, you could wind up with $9. And if you get the same multiple, you can have $180, $200 stock. I mean, that's not our base case. But um, so no, I have no interest in I do, I have no interest in predicting the future with EV charging or how much penetration EVs will get, or any of that stuff. I buy durable, predictable, quality cash flows when they're temporarily impaired either due to market sector or company dislocation uh, that that um, I can have reasonable confidence will either revert back to the mean or uh, if they're if they're unimpaired just just revert back to normal uh, uh, multiple assignment when sentiment changes so, uh, this is not my game. Uh, Ron Barron would be your best guy if you want to invest with people who predict the future and do it well. Ron Barron's your guy, uh, but um, uh, I find it um, 
much easier to bet on sure things when no one wants them and, uh, and, and done very well doing that. And as a matter of fact, Ron Barron is the exception. If you look at the people who are active managers throughout time, the, the people who have made the most money over the years, over the decades, have been doing what I do and doing it really well, whether it's Tepper, Cooperman, Buffett, um, um, Klarman, um, and the list goes on and on. So, so this game of predicting the future, you, you know, you meet a couple of people at the golf course that got lucky, lucky, and you know, took a gamble on something and, and won and made a ten bagger and all that stuff. But they usually give it back to the casino. Uh, James Runyon, do you see any issues on the horizon from approximately eleven trillion dollars of corporate debt maturing over the next few years while the Federal Reserve is holding us in high interest rate environment? Um, two things, James. One, you're probably reading too much Zero Hedge. And two, um, your assumption is faulty. I don't think, I think we'll be held at uh, elevated levels of rates probably through the end of the year. Uh, but then we'll probably have one or two cuts. And then from there, it will be determined by the economic data. But uh, high levels of rates is not, you know, if we wind up at a terminal of we're at 5.1, let's say it's even 5.35, and then we, we go back to 4.50. 4.50 historically is nothing. They can absolutely refinance that and or raise equity or a combination of both because the economy is going to be doing exceptionally well. Uh, Kayla Smith, longtime viewer, you show an unusual question, but one I must ask, will Baba's split be dangerous or cause headaches for long-term holders of leap call options? Um, like I always say, you got to own the stock first and then anything you own in terms of derivatives is just whipped cream. Um, in this case, you will own five of the six pieces through BABA, um, but the question is where is the cloud spun? Is it spun in Hong Kong or the US? My guess is it will be spun in both because they'll want it to be a monster IPO and they'll get more liquidity and a higher multiple doing it in the US, but it's, you know, it's hard to, you know, game out uh, politics over the, you know, next 12 months. But my guess is it will be in the US, in which case you'll probably get a stub option on um, AliCloud, but that's not guaranteed. So, um, but you'll still own five out of the six pieces through your ownership of the BABA options and more likely than not, you'll get a stub, but you gotta own the stock first. That has to be your core position and options, if you're going to do, should just be whipped cream to juice it a little bit, but not impair your return materially um, uh, if there is uh, some hair on it, depending how the winds blow. Uh, Sophia, Emma, Thomas, you are the best. Okay, thank you. Are you sure this is not for my mom? Okay, no. Uh, I could elaborate endlessly about the value you bring and the quality of your advice, but I know AMA time is limited. Wanted to get my question in. Uh, and we'll do that in a future AMA, thanks. Uh, your calls on Vornado and Generac and others are panning out exactly as predicted. Good work. My question is about BABA and China and a weakening dollar. Can you walk us through your thesis behind a weakening dollar and how and why we feel it's gonna weaken and improve in the near or short term, if the Fed maintains a 5% plus effective funds rate, then presumably, presumably the dollar will stay strong for an elongated periods of time against uh, emerging markets uh, and uh, like China, which is still easing. Okay, so two things. Um, number one is it's it's the interest rate differential. So the EU is still tightening relative and at a faster pace than the US. So our base case is that the pound, the euro, uh, probably emerging markets currencies as well, will appreciate relative to the US dollar. And then if you look at uh, positioning on the US dollar, uh, which we've covered many times, you can see that Usually you don't get a bottom in the dollar until commercials are well above the flat line in contracts. And we're nowhere near that. We're still around negative 20,000. 
So, um, so we think this is going to, you know, stay subdued and probably, probably drift down into the nineties. Uh, and that will be a boon for, uh, emerging markets. Uh, we're not worried about that in terms of, um, we're towards the end of our tightening cycle. Uh, the rest of the world is still relatively, um, uh, tightening in a more serious fashion. Uh, and, uh, and we think that down, downtrend will continue. I mean, all that has to happen is it stays subdued. It's already moved a lot. But uh, we think it's going to trend, trend even lower. Um, furthermore, China soft pegs its currency to the USD. Why are they not pegging a strong yuan against the dollar? Because they want the export advantage. And they're also concerned about what's happening with Japan and the quid pro quo with the coordinated central bank policy. Uh, so that's how they're going to boost their exports. Uh, thanks again. You're simply the best. Thank you very much. That was very kind of you uh, to send, Sophia. Uh, Brian Maida, uh, longtime follower of your content, appreciate it. At what point would you abandon your Bali, Alibaba trade? So many positive catalysts have materialized and a few negative ones. Is it possible the share price stays depressed despite fundamentals? At what point do you make that call? Um, so, um, The condition under which I would sell my Alibaba would be that their cash flows significant, uh, significantly deteriorate. And the opposite is true. It would be like asking me, you own 10,000 apartment buildings uh, in two states. When are you going to get out of those states? When I see the cash flows are significantly depositing, otherwise I'm going to hold them for a long time. Um, or if some someone offers me three, four X of what they're worth, which I think is going to be the case with Alibaba in a, in a couple of years. So um, so nothing's changed in the underlying business. Uh, the difference between uh, me and the person asking this question is um, more likely oh, I, this person is on a lot of leverage and they're a bit of, you know, they're they're probably playing cowboy games. And, and in that case, I'd be very worried. But if you're not on leverage and you own a super high quality business uh, and there's no material impairments to cash generation uh, and you're buying it at a historic low multiple, there's nothing to think about. You can read all the headlines you want all day about negative this and Blinken and Biden and gaffes and nonsense. But at the end of the day, uh, is the business performing better or worse? And what am I paying for? What am I paying and what am I getting? And right now, I'm paying less than you've ever been able to pay to get a better business than you've been able to, ever been able to get. Uh, and for me, then there's nothing to think about. So uh, I hope that answers your question. And um, Bob Johnson. Hey, Tom, Bob, again, wanted to add some anecdotal feedback from China. Maybe your team can look into it further if they haven't already. My wife works for a global furniture entity based out of China and many other colleagues who live across the major tier one cities are saying that WeChat, WeChat Pay is lately gaining market share against Alipay as both Alibaba and Tencent restart their collaboration with Visa and MasterCard to make it easier for foreigners to transact in China. Good news is it will hopefully create more frictionless travel for into China tourism industry, but would like to get your team to shed some light on market share dynamics between WeChat Pay and Alipay post COVID. Uh, this is just noise. Number one, you're being assigned exactly zero dollars for owning a third of one of the largest payment systems in Asia. Uh, that's going to continue to have a huge moat around it and will gain share and will be involved in the huge tourism uh, mechanism that's playing out. Uh, so, you know, all Alipay is or Ant Financial is for us is just a free option. We are in this business for the cloud. Number one, Taobao Tmall, number two, as a toll gate for the consumer coming back uh, after being locked down for three years. They've been out of captivity for five months. Let's give them a, give the patient a little time to recover. We started to see it in June for 618 with the volumes coming up. Uh, but as far as this goes, uh, this is just noise and, um, and it's a free option. So I think we have like 10% of the whole value of our, our estimated value and some of the parts assigned to that. But I, I think when all is said and done, it's going to be worth. Uh, it's going to be one of the most valuable pieces of the business. So, uh, not not more valuable than the cloud, though. So, Ron Amchin, what are your thoughts on Target? 
We did cover this a few weeks ago. I, I said that uh, it'll probably work, but um, it's not for us. There's just too many other things to do. I don't like this business. I, I just, I'm just gonna pass. Um, I think it's good for trading. I think it's gonna probably pop in the short term, but uh, I don't wanna own it right now. So I'll just leave it at that. Next is Moni Kiev. Um, thanks for sharing your knowledge. Sorry if I missed this in the previous podcast. What are your asset allocation rules? Is it based on position size to overall portfolio size? Have you ever broken a rule when you believe in an opportunity? Uh, generally, no. I mean, we went a little over 20% is our max position for the highest possible conviction we have. We went a couple points over that for Alibaba. Uh, we're glad we did because our last purchase was at 61 and change. So um, um, that's how we do it. It comes down to you manage risk by how you size it. And you can do more size for the things that are the surest bets. So, you know, I, I you, you may have some 10x expected value things, but they're not sure bets. Uh, so maybe they're only a couple of percent in the portfolio because if it, you know if it goes to 10x, it's a meaningful contributor because it's 20 or 30 percent to the portfolio. But if it goes to zero and you lose two percent or three percent, you live another day. So with those more high risk, high return, you have to size it accordingly. In the case of Baba, I mean, I, it doesn't have 10x upside, but um, we can lean in with a lot of capital because the downside is very limited based on the price that we're buying the stock and or the company rather. So I, you know, I was sharing with some friends at, uh, at dinner in Greenwich, I was like, and they all love doing private deals. And there's a lot of value in doing private deals. I just love public deals because number one is you have liquidity. If you want liquidity, i.e. if, if something with a better opportunity, uh, opportunity comes out, you can get your money and get into it. Whereas in a private deal, you're tied up for three years or five years or whatever. Um, but number two, the prices that the market serves up for the highest quality, durable businesses with moats from time to time, you know, at, at any one point in time, there's always something to do. But on an individual company, maybe you get an opportunity like we got an Alibaba once in every five or every 10 years for that company. And it's usually due to some country or market or sector dislocation. Um, the private markets will never serve up that level of pricing because there are other dynamics at play that aren't at play in the public market, in the private markets, which are how people are positioned and um, most institutional managers not having permanent capital. So when a position goes, you know, is down 60 or 80, they're all dumping at the same time. So you get this aberrational, unnatural price that no matter how bad things were in 2009 or 2020, if you walked into a boardroom or you tried to do a private deal, as, as gloomy and scary as things were during those periods, no one in a, in a rational, private market conversation would ever offer those prices that the pandemic offered up in certain public companies in the public markets. And that happens, you know, every few years for great businesses, for garbage businesses, you can see them all the, all day long and, and you can take punts on them or not take punts on them. That's not what we do. But for high quality, durable cash flows, the beauty is every year, one or two generational opportunities are served up because when one group is flying or one country is flying, another one is in the gutter. And we look for what's in the gutter that we know has long term staying power and we can buy at an abnormal price. Is the price we're paying one that would be rejected by any rational board and we would be carried out by security guards for being impolite? and uh, completely unrealistic. Is that the price we're paying in the public market? And if that's true, we're gonna, it's probably gonna be a maximum size position of 20%. Uh, um, and, and they don't come around very often. So when it rains gold, you pull out the bucket, not the thimble. Uh, and that's what we did with Baba. And we know that's gonna pay 
Uh, it's just, you know, one of those that takes longer than, rather than shorter. Range resources took longer rather than shorter, and it's only halfway uh, up the flagpole and uh, already four times six, you know, six bagger and just getting started. So um, that's why I love what I do. I mean, it's it's just, I feel like I'm on a treasure hunt every single day. So I am grateful that you're joining me on that treasure hunt and you're tuning in. I wish everyone a fantastic uh, Independence Day, got the greatest country in the world, most opportunity, uh, very, very exciting time. So with that said, uh, wishing you all the best. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.